Edward Donald Slovic was born on February 18, 1920, to Anna and Josef Sławikowski, a Polish-American family living in Dearborn, Michigan. Eddie Slovic was described as a troubled youth in his early years, frequently getting into trouble with the law starting when he was arrested at 12 years old for breaking into a foundry to steal brass. From the ages of 12 to 17, Slovic would be arrested several times for petty theft, breaking and entering, and other minor crimes. He was fully imprisoned at the age of 17 on October of 1937, and was paroled a year later on September of 1938. He found himself back in prison, however, after he was arrested in January of 1939 for stealing and crashing a car. He was paroled for the last time in April of 1942, and began working for Montella Plumbing and Heating in Dearborn, Michigan. That was where he met a woman by the name of Antoinette Wisniewski, who was working as the bookkeeper for the company's owner. They hit it off, and by November 7th of 1942, they were married. All the while, World War II was raging, and America was ramping up its involvement in the European front, fighting a vicious war in North Africa alongside the other allies against the Axis. Men across the country were being drafted to fight, but due to his criminal record, Eddie had been classified as morally unfit for duty and was never drafted. That changed in late 1943, however, when he was reclassified as being fit for duty and was subsequently drafted. After making his way through basic training, Private Eddie Slovic was sent to France, arriving on August 20th of 1944 as one of 12 replacements for Company G of the 109th Infantry Regiment, US 28th Infantry Division. During basic training, Slovic had become friends with Private John Tankey, another soldier sent as a replacement for the company. During their movement to meet up with the company, however, the group that Slovic and Tankey were traveling with were pinned down during an artillery attack and separated from the rest of the detachment. During this encounter with German artillery, Slovak said he found out he wasn't cut out for combat and began to think of ways to leave the front lines before he was killed. Eventually, Slovak and Tanky found a Canadian military police unit and stayed with them for the next six weeks. Tanky wrote to the 109th Regiment explaining that they had been separated from the rest of the detachment and were able to return to duty on October 7th, 1944. No charges were ever filed on either of them because a lot of replacements were having trouble finding their units due to the rapid movement of the Allied forces. One day after returning to his unit, on October 8, 1944, Slovak decided to ask his company commander, Captain Ralph Grady, about desertion. Slovak told his commander that he was too scared to serve in the frontline company he had been assigned to, and asked if running away would be considered desertion. Captain Grady told him it would, and refused to reassign him. The next day, October 9th, Slovak took matters into his own hands. Tanky tried to persuade him not to desert, worried about the punishment his friend might face, but his mind had already been made up. He walked several miles to the headquarters attachment and approached an enlisted cook with a handwritten note, confessing his intent to desert. It read, I, Private Eddie D. Slovak, 36896415, confessed to the desertion of the United States Army. At the time of my desertion, we were in Elbeuf in France. I came to Elbeuf as a replacement. They were shelling the town, and we were told to dig in for the night. The following morning, they were shelling us again. I was so scared, nerves, and trembling. At the time the other replacements moved out, I couldn't move. I stayed there in my foxhole till it was quiet and I was able to move. I then walked into town. Not seeing any of our troops, so I stayed overnight at a French hospital. The next morning I turned myself over to the Canadian Provost Corps. After being with them six weeks, I was turned over to an American MP. They turned me loose. I told my commanding officer my story. I said that if I had to go out there again, I'd run away. He said there was nothing he could do for me, so I ran away again, and I'll run away again if I have to go out there. Signed Private Eddie D. Slovic. ASN 36896415. The cook took Slovic to an MP, who then took him to his company commander, who urged Slovic to destroy the note, effectively asking him to take his confession back in privacy in order to avoid any punishments. Slovic believed the worst he would face was the short prison sentence that had been standard for deserters, 
and that his sentence would be commuted after the end of the war. So Slovak was confident he was better off taking the punishment and avoiding military service. He already had a criminal record, so a dishonorable discharge would make little more impact in him getting a job back in America. So Slovak refused to destroy his note. He was taken before Lieutenant Colonel Ross Henbest, who once again offered Slovak the chance to tear up his note, but Slovak refused once more. Henbest told Slovak to write on the back of the note that he understood the consequences of desertion, and that this note would be used as evidence against him. After being taken into custody, he was put in a division stockade, and then brought before the division's Judge Advocate General, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Somer. Somer offered Slovak one final opportunity to rejoin his unit in exchange for the charges being dropped, also offering for Slovak to be reassigned to a different division where he could start with a clean slate. He refused one final time, saying, I've made up my mind, I'll take my court-martial. At this time, during the war, the 28th Infantry Division was expected to begin its attack in the Hirtgen Forest, which ended up lasting from September 19th until December 16th. Even before it began, it was expected to be very deadly, which led to an increase in desertion from other soldiers afraid of dying in combat. Slovak was tried by court-martial on November 11, 1944, and was charged with desertion to avoid hazardous duty. He opted not to testify for himself, likely believing that it made little difference in the resulting outcome. In the end, he was unsurprisingly found guilty of desertion by the nine officers of the court. However, he was sentenced to death, a sentence that was approved by Major General Norman Coda, who said, Given the situation as I knew it in November 1944, I thought it was my duty to this country to approve that sentence. If I hadn't approved it, if I had let Slovak accomplish his purpose, I don't know how I could have gone up to the line and looked a good soldier in the face. Slovak was shocked by his sentence and pleaded for clemency, writing to General Dwight D. Eisenhower in early December of 1944. However, with desertion becoming an even larger issue in France, as the Battle of the Bulge began, Eisenhower confirmed Slovak's execution on December 23, 1944. The execution was set to take place at 10.04 a.m. on January 31st of 1945, near the village of Sainte marie aux mines completed by firing squad. As he prepared for his own death, Slovak said that, They're not shooting me for deserting the United States Army. Thousands of guys have done that. They just need to make an example out of somebody, and I'm it, because I'm an ex-con. I used to steal things when I was a kid, and that's what they are shooting me for. They're shooting me for the bread and chewing gum I stole when I was 12 years old. All of Slovak's military insignias, buttons, and other identifying items were taken off of him, and he was given a blanket to keep himself warm. The location of the execution was a house's courtyard with high walls, intended to keep stray bullets from leaving the courtyard and to prevent any spectators from trying to watch. Slovak was strapped to a wooden post across his chest, legs, and under his arms so that he wouldn't slump while the shots were being fired. Twelve men were selected from the 109th Regiment, and all twelve were given standard M1 Garands, with eleven of them having one bullet, and one of them having a blank round. The attending chaplain, Father Carl Patrick Cummings, spoke to Slovak before a hood was placed over his head, saying, Eddie, when you get up there, say a little prayer for me. Slovak responded, saying, Okay, Father, I'll pray that you don't follow me too soon. The hood was then placed over Eddie Slovak's head, and the men were told to fire. All eleven bullets hit, with four of them being fatal. An army physician on site quickly noted that Slovak was not yet dead, but as the men reloaded to fire another volley, he died at the age of 24. The entire execution took only 15 minutes. Private Eddie Slovak was buried at Wazane American Cemetery and Memorial, specifically alongside other American soldiers who had been executed for other crimes such as rape or murder. In this cemetery, none of the plots have the soldiers' names. 
instead having an identification number for every soldier, so only those with the information available know the exact location of each soldier. Eddie Slovik's wife, Antoinette, spent the rest of her life petitioning the army for her husband's remains to be returned to Michigan until her death in 1979. In 1981, Bernard Kalka, the Macomb County Commissioner and a Polish-American World War II veteran, took up Antoinette's case and petitioned for the return of Slovik's remains. In 1987, Kalka managed to convince then-President Ronald Reagan to approve for Slovik's remains to be exhumed and returned to the United States. He was moved from Row 3, Grave 65 of Plot E to Detroit's Woodmere Cemetery, where he was reburied next to his wife. Seven separate presidents were also petitioned to grant Slovak a posthumous pardon. Harry S. Truman, Dwight D. Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, and Jimmy Carter, although no such pardons were ever granted. The tale of Eddie Slovak is an interesting one, with analysts still debating the legitimacy of Slovak's execution. While his crime is indisputable, there's a lot of concern over his sentence, and why he was sentenced to death. While dozens of soldiers were executed by the US government over the course of the First and Second World War for various crimes, Eddie Slovik was the only one executed for desertion, and was, in fact, the first soldier executed in almost 100 years since the Civil War, and he's been the only soldier executed for desertion since. Colonel Robert C. Bard of the Judge Advocate General's Office noted that between January of 1942 and June of 1948, 2,864 army personnel were tried for desertion. 49 were convicted and sentenced to death, but 48 of those sentences were commuted by a higher authority, leaving only Eddie Slovik to be executed. After all of the dust had settled, at least one of the members of the tribunal came to believe Slovik's execution was an example of injustice brought on by a flawed process. And Eddie Slovik, while undoubtedly guilty of the crimes he was accused of, seems to be a victim of circumstance nonetheless, used by military authorities to prove an example. But at least now he can reside alongside his wife in the country he once called home. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like, and if you want to see more, I have plenty of videos about history and some alternate history. There's probably something that will interest you, so go ahead and check some of them out. Subscribe to see more of my content in the future, and ring that bell so you can stay notified when I do upload a video. I also have a Twitter if you want to stay up to date with me or what's going on with my channel. Thank you guys so much for watching, this has been Historical Hindsight, and I'll be seeing you soon.